only trying to fit that presidential. Okay. I call to order the February meeting of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. Good morning. I would like to thank everyone joining us in the boardroom and those joining us via live stream today. I would also note that we have uh, Regent Hipsch attending by Zoom. At the outside, outset, I would like to note a change in the order of our agenda. We will take the agenda in order until we reach item eight, our selection of finalists to be interviewed for president of the University of Minnesota. Instead, we will take up the reports of the committees first, followed by any old or new business, and then we will return to the finalist selection. We will also defer item 12, the resolution to conduct a non-public meeting of the board to discuss any attorney-client privilege matters until the board meeting in March. Our first item is approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? There being no discussion, all those in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Please say no. The motion is approved. Next, we will move to the report of Interim President Ettinger. President Ettinger. Thank you so much, Chair Mayron and members of the board. I'll try to keep my remarks today relatively brief as I realize the board has a lot of other important business at hand. We've reached the eve of the state legislative session, which officially kicks off on Monday. As you know, our university capital budget request totaling $500 million would allow the renewal of more than 150 buildings to support education, research, and outreach across the state of Minnesota. This funding would help address a large and growing backlog of facility needs on all of our campuses. We are also advancing a supplemental budget request, which includes $45 million in recurring operational funds. This would allow the university to keep costs lower for students by minimizing tuition increases, as well as addressing a portion of expected cost increases. In addition, there's an amendment to the supplemental budget request that was presented in committee yesterday based on the university's vision for an academic health system as presented to the governor's task force on academic health. This proposed amendment requests $80 million annually to improve healthcare by expanding and enhancing training opportunities to grow the pool of health professionals in Minnesota, improving equity and access to clinical care for underserved populations, and enhancing research to improve health outcomes. Allocation of the requested amount to specific areas and programs might need to be adjusted depending on outcomes of negotiations with clinical partners and or the legislative action during the session, and we will keep the board updated as the session progresses. I was glad to have the opportunity, along with all of you around the table, to speak with legislators at your, the breakfast session yesterday morning. And I'll continue to be engaged with state and federal legislative leaders throughout the session. Just last week, Executive Director for Government and Community Relations, Melissa Lopez Franzen and I were in Southern Minnesota, along with Minnesota State Chancellor, Scott Olson. We met with editorial and news writers from Rochester and Winona to discuss the role our systems play for all Minnesotans and stress the importance of, our, of state investments in our capital requests. Again this year, we'll be counting on strong engagement for our many advocates around the state and beyond, including students, faculty and staff, and the U of M system's 600,000 plus alumni. Melissa and her office will be active in coordinating these activities, but we need everyone's voice as we speak on behalf of a better University of Minnesota. Of course, our outreach efforts extend beyond our elected officials. I recently conducted interviews covering many University of Minnesota topics with the Minnesota Daily and with the Star Tribune editorial board. I also had the chance to talk with the Minnesota State Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors and the Twin Cities Communication Council. I'd like to briefly address the ongoing conflict in the Middle East and some of its ramifications on our campuses. Let me first say that I understand the human toll that this conflict has taken on people connected to the U. Every day there are students and employees, some of whom I've met with, that wake up not knowing if their relatives and friends are okay. 
Since October 7th, we have focused our efforts on supporting members of our community with all available university resources, and we will continue to do so. I'd like to also clearly state that this university will not tolerate calls for genocide for any class of people at the university. This university has a strong record of responding to and acting against bias or misconduct in all its forms, no matter who is the perpetrator and who is the victim. On the issue of speech, I've held several listening sessions with students, faculty, and alumni, and I've taken the opportunity to reiterate that the university needs to remain a place where people can express their opinions, whether they're students, staff, or faculty. As a public research university, we must provide a place for the expression of diverse views and opinions. It's not just required by the U.S. Constitution, it's a core part of our mission. The university supports the right of all members of our community to speak and peacefully demonstrate about ideas they support or to protest against ideas they find unjust or offensive. This includes students and, of course, our faculty. The Board of Regents policy on academic freedom and responsibility states that faculty and academic staff have the freedom to speak and write on matters of public concern, but they also have the responsibility to ensure that when they speak, they make it clear they are not speaking for the institution. The administration has been working with individual faculty and departments to ensure that we uphold this department, including disclaimers that these statements do not represent the views of the university. We continue to work with university governance, and especially the Faculty Senate, the Faculty Consultative Committee, and the Academic Freedom and Tenure Committee to consider how to provide guidance for members of our university community on statements of matters of public concern. As is the case with many issues of public significance, full engagement from all quarters of the university in this policy development, and a corresponding respect for hearing out all points of view, is itself part of the educational mission of the university. We want to take the time to do this right, which will involve the new president of the university once they are named. At last February's Board of Regents meeting, the university announced its intention to return the Cloquet Forestry Center to the Fond du Lac Band. Conversations and discussions have continued since that time as we move forward. As a next step in that process, on Tuesday, the university will be hosting a public engagement session at the Cloquet Forestry Center. Last week, I had the opportunity to attend an event to celebrate the launch of CLA's George Morrison Center for Indigenous Arts. This new center is a great example of the type of interdisciplinary, publicly engaged work that the university is known for, involving partners from multiple CLA departments and community organizations. It honors the late George Morrison, a member of the Grand Portage Band of the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe, who was a renowned painter and sculptor. Morrison taught American Indian Studies and Art at the University of Minnesota from 1970 to 1983. February is Black History Month, and events and celebrations are taking place across our campuses. I attended the 43rd annual Martin Luther King Jr. Tribute Concert at Ten Ted Mann Concert Hall on January 14th, and I really appreciated both the poignant stories and the impressive artistic talent that were part of that event. And University Relations is featuring the annual Where It Starts series of stories of our students, faculty, staff, and alumni on the U of M website. They highlight individuals and communities who continue to make black history at the University of Minnesota and beyond. Our search for the next University of Minnesota Duluth Chancellor is well underway. The committee has completed first round interviews and they will be forwarding their recommendations to me in the coming weeks. We are on track to conduct public interviews later this spring. And we have some good news from the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. The UMAA Board of Directors has approved a new memorandum of understanding with the university, replacing the last version from 2008. And this board will have the opportunity to take action on the MOU later this morning. The driving factor of the new agreement is brand alignment, with the UMMA now being able to use the university's Block M in tandem with Alumni Association as part of its brand identity. Credit goes to the many alumni volunteer leaders who have worked on this new agreement over the past few years. Also, last Tuesday was the 120th anniversary of the UMAA, 
Governor Walz proclaimed January 30th to be University of Minnesota Alumni Association Day in the state of Minnesota. So congratulations, UMMA, and here's to the next 120 years. <laughs> Frankly, finally, I'd like to acknowledge Senior Vice President Myron Franz, who announced he will retire from the university later this year. He will step down as Senior VP for Finance and Operations as of March 1st, but has agreed to serve as a senior advisor to me part-time, focusing on our clinical partnerships related to academic medicine. Myron has been at the table for our academic health negotiations, and I deeply appreciate his willingness to continue leading in this realm over the next several months to ensure the best possible conclusion to this important effort. I'm incredibly thankful for Myron's service. He's been an invaluable partner to me and countless others in the university. And I think about my interactions with Myron, he's, he's strategic, he's versatile, he's hardworking, and he's effective. He gets things done for this university and he will be hard to replace. We will launch the national search for the next university senior vice president and we'll keep the university community updated as the search progresses. That concludes my report. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Thank you, Interim President Ettinger. Turning to my report, I'd like to highlight a few exciting items that have happened since we last met in December and outline a few upcoming ways for members of the University of Minnesota community to engage. First of all, my board colleagues and I would like to extend our congratulations to the University of Minnesota Twin Cities dance team for winning their national championship title in the POM, P-O-M category, and second place in jazz. You may have seen their remarkable jazz routines that went viral on social media. Additionally, the UMD dance team claimed second in open jazz and third in open POM category. Both teams showed tremendous athleticism and made our entire university community proud. Later in the agenda, we will take up two very consequential items. The recommendation of the Presidential Search Advisory Committee and a new non-binding letter of intent with Fairview Health Services. Both of these items will profoundly impact the university for years to come, and I look forward to the board discussing and acting on these topics later this morning. Earlier this week, the Governor's Task Force on Academic Health at the University of Minnesota released its recommendations to support world-class academic health professions, education, research, and care delivery. The Special Committee on Academic Health started our review of those recommendations yesterday, and the board will continue to engage with the recommendations in the months ahead. I would like to extend our great appreciation to Regent Penny Wheeler, Dean Connie Delaney, and Vice President Jacob Toller for their service on the task force. Yesterday, my colleagues and I had the pleasure of meeting with many members of the Minnesota legislature over breakfast in advance of Monday's start at the 2024 legislative session. To help advance our legislative goals, I'd like to encourage everybody in the university community to consider attending the U of M Day at the Capitol on Thursday, February 22. If you are interested in joining students, faculty, staff, and regents for a rally in support of state funding to advance the university's mission of education, research, and outreach across the state, you can learn more at government-relations.umn.edu. That concludes my comments, and we will now continue with our agenda. Item number four is to receive and file reports. Please note those items reported in the docket materials. Next, we will move to the consent report. The consent report includes gifts, the election of an interim treasurer in light of senior vice president Franz's retirement announcement, a memorandum of understanding with the University of Minnesota Alumni Association, the report of the All University Honors Committee, and the report of the Naming Committee. I'll note that interim president Ettinger has recused himself from the portion of the gifts item in the consent report related to the Hormel Foundation and Hormel Foods Corporation. So I bring those items or that item to you with my recommendation. 
Before I invite a motion to approve the consent report, are there any questions or comments or requests to separate out an item? Seeing none, hearing none, is there a motion to, to approve the consent report? So moved. Second. Thank you, any discussion? There being no discussion, all those in favor of approving the consent report, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion is approved. Thank you. <clears throat> Moving now to our next item on the agenda, we will act on the university's performance and accountability report, which outlines ways we are delivering on our mission. The university has had tremendous success over the past year within key areas of the Impact 2025 system-wide strategic plan. Interim President Ettinger and Provost Croson, are there any changes or highlights you wish to address before I seek a motion? Yeah, thank you, Chair Mayron and members of the board. Last month, Provost Croson presented the university's annual performance and accountability report. The version in your docket materials today is slightly different than what was presented to you in December, so I'd ask Provost Croson to review those with you briefly, and then we would be happy to take any questions before you vote, and Provost Croson's available to us via Zoom this morning. Thank you. Provost Croson. Thank you, Interim President Edinger, Chair Mayron, and members of the board. We seek your approval of the University Performance and Accountability Report, which we presented and reviewed with you in draft version at your December meeting. Since that time, proofreading has resulted in small corrections and clarifications, each of which is outlined in the docket. We've also included peer institution graduation rate comparisons for each campus, which became available between the December and the February meeting. I want to repeat my thanks and acknowledgement to the multiple units that work together to produce this document, especially colleagues in university relations, the Office of Institutional Analysis, and the President and the Provost's offices. Chair Mayron, members of the board, Interim President Edinger and I recommend the University Performance and Accountability Report for your approval. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the resolution related to the University Performance and Accountability Report? Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? There being no discussion, all those in favor of approving the resolution related to the University Performance and Accountability Report, please say aye. 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 Please, uh, all those opposed, please say no. The motion is approved. Our next item is to review and act on a letter of intent with Fairview. With us today are Interim President Ettinger, Senior Vice President Franz, and Vice President Tolar. Interim President Ettinger, would you like to start us off on this very exciting item? Very much so. Thank you very much, Chair Mayron. We are bringing forward to you today a resolution to approve a non-binding letter of intent, or LOI, that will establish a new path forward for the University of Minnesota in our relationship with Fairview Health Services. As you know, we have been engaged in conversation with Fairview for many months about refining the terms of our relationship. <coughs> this LOI signals an agreement to advance discussions toward creating a new relationship with Fairview centered around the university's eventual ownership and control of the facilities comprising the University of Minnesota Medical Center. It allows the parties to begin the next steps of due diligence around creating such a relationship. This LOI supports the University of Minnesota's five-point vision for academic health, which was articulated in January of 2023 and presented to the Governor's Task Force on Academic Health in December. The university's vision for academic health specifically foresees a new hospital as part of the University of Minnesota Medical Center. The vision articulates urgency in planning now for that new facility and how best to integrate it into a new UMMC owned and operated by the university. The letter of intent has been approved by the governing boards of Fairview Health Services and the University of Minnesota Physicians. The LOI leaves much for future consideration as we work in the coming months, along with Fairview and the UMP, to develop a new definitive agreement. 
Both Vice President Jacob Tolar and Senior Vice President Myron Franz will now provide you with more background and details about the non-binding LOI and today's resolution. And I'd like to first turn it over to Dr. Tolar. Dr. Tolar, take it away. Madam Chair, Mr. President, Regents, I'm delighted to be here with you again, and thank you very much for taking up this timely issue that will, with your support, change the trajectory of the clinical enterprise at the University of Minnesota. Today's discussion is important for many reasons, including to provide some clarity to our clinical and research teams, clarity to the public, and hopefully clarity to the leaders in the community as well. The most important part of that is that with your approval, we can truly begin. We can truly begin to work towards an essential component of success of the University of Minnesota in the healthcare ecosystem of the state. This is a positive reframing of an evolutionary trajectory that we have uh, started decades ago, maybe more than a century ago with your guidance. And uh, we are very proud of what has been achieved. And as I reported to you yesterday, the medical school is again in top 25 medical schools in the United States, in the top 10 of the public medical schools. And this is part of what we are doing here with other health science schools, and that is to achieve a world-class academic healthcare system. That academic healthcare system that's top-notch, that's internationally, nationally, locally renowned at the University of Minnesota ensures that access to the leading-edge care is available to everyone. We always, I always ask myself a question, what does it feel like to be sick, really sick, in the United States today, especially if you are poor? And my position always has been that poor people deserve the top-notch health care <clears throat> as anybody else. That's why university is so important. That's why the innovation is a core value of what we do and training of the next generation, same thing. That's how we transmit values and virtues of the medical profession and other health science professions to the people who will come after us and take this, hopefully, a little cleaner, a little better organized, a little more fair than we have inherited it from our predecessors. We are very proud of what we have accomplished with the Joint Clinical <coughs> Enterprise. I can tell you that the metrics of clinical excellence, such as quality and safety, productivity, market share, have been all very good. We have increased the clinical trial enrollments and made strides in the learner experience. Our hospital leaders, our physician leaders, have been on training for the last six or uh, five years to, uh, to learn what does it take to run a hospital? What's that, what does it take to run a service line? What does it take to run a clinical group practice? We are, through this session and last year and the task force, we have seen, and I hope you have seen as well, that we have been affirmed in the value that we provide to the state and the needs of the access for all Minnesotans. We have also learned, which is sort of existential point, that uh, to do all this requires different level of control, different level of accountability, different le level of obligation uh, for our clinical work than we have today. So why does this matter? This is about academic medicine. The academic medicine means all three missions. The clinical care without innovation is limping, is getting behind. The clinical care without training is not fulfilling the promise that physicians have as the mentors to the, to the generations to come. So the way we integrate all of these things, three things together is important about how we think about the new questions, how we change standards of care that are unacceptable because, because many conditions known to man are not survivable or result in chronic disability and misery and suffering of, of enormous dimension. And thinking about these new questions, thinking about how clinical trials can add benefit and innovations in the care models is the only way we can improve not just efficiency, not just care, but the cost of that care. There's no other way. 
Now, it's important, I think, to see it from the point of the patients. That is one of the secrets, not so secret, secrets of the US healthcare business, that the patients are really not the customers. So if I want to know whether my clinic works or my OR or my ICU, I ask my patients because they see it. And we, any one of us have been on that receiving end of this and knows very well that it looks very different to you as a patient or your loved one, or if you are the clinician or if you are administrator in the hospital. So the way uh, we look at this is that we need to get to accomplish all that ambition. We need to control the operations. We need to control investments. We need to control the programmatic developments in the care uh, settings. And, and deep down, it is really a question for you, for us, for our clinical teams, what are the current circumstances calling us to do? What, what, what choices are we going to be defined in and through making them today and making them in the uh, imminent future? And as President Edinger articulated, we need to plan for the new hospital that will support the academic medical system. And if we do that, we can better support all the three missions of the, uh, of the academic medical center, recruit academic physician leaders, expand the clinical enterprise with the innovative band and, and the foundation, partner with the state on access, on equity, on productivity, and really make it to work for people that are sick or can become sick, as uh, Regent Van Halen correctly pointed out uh, uh, yesterday in the, in the committee, it is the prevention, it is the social aspect of medicine that is gonna be much more prominent. And we are here to really, uh, to really develop not just the set of skills to be maximized. Anybody can do that in the clinical or research or educational. We are here to really build character of service and care individually, collectively, in the clinical enterprise and in the, in, the, uh, in the research and educational bandwidth. And I understand that there are risks and complexity ahead. Uh, our teams are ready. We have trained for this for the last six years at least. And we are here to serve at your charge. And I, we are all energized by the possibilities that come uh, with the letter of intent. And I welcome it, especially because I have SVP Myron Franz as my partner, and he left his phone on the desk over there. That's good, Myron. And <laughs> I'll turn to him now for more specifics about the resolution in front of us. Madam Chair, uh, Interim President Edinger, and uh, members of the board. Uh, I, yeah, I do have accompanying music if you would like it. Um, <laughs> But we'll uh, dispense with that. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Interim President Ettinger, for your kind remarks about me. But this actually is a good example of the teamwork that goes into a project like this. Uh, the amount of teamwork engaged in this process has been truly remarkable uh, in terms of the amount of time and the effort and energy. <clears throat> and they, uh, to the extent I ever look good up here, it's because of their work, not mine. And as you know, that's not an easy task sometimes. But uh, I really do want to thank all the people who have been so hard working on this, both on the Fairview side and on our side, on UMP side. <clears throat> but from the start of this current partnership with Fairview in 1997 and through the formation of the current Joint Clinical Enterprise Agreement in 2018, we've learned much about how best to fulfill our mission of the university mission and Fairview, their mission, to serve the people of Minnesota. We understand that we must continue to evolve how we work together to best meet the current and the future needs of our patients, our talented employees, and our community. We are now taking those very first critical steps toward a new and reimagined partnership. Obviously, one part of this first step is planning for the university to develop our best operating model internally and the talent for running an academic medical center. As Interim President Ettinger said, the letter of intent establishes a framework for the University of Minnesota to acquire the academic health facilities on and around the Twin Cities campus. And, and as he mentioned, this is referred to as the University of Minnesota Medical Center, or UMMC. This includes the East Bank Hospital, the West Bank Hospital, the Masonic Children's Hospital, and the Clinics and Surgery Center. Now, the letter of intent provides an approach in which the university would, in phases, and over a period of time, gain ownership and control of UMMC and its operations. In the coming months, the university 
University of Minnesota physicians, and Fairview Health Services will engage in necessary due diligence and negotiate definitive agreements by September 30, 2024 outlining how we will work together in the years to come. The proposed transaction will be subject to regulatory approvals and board approvals before we can move forward. Following the necessary approvals, the first step in the transition period would begin with the university purchase of 51% of UMMC. This first step would be followed by a transition period in which the university and Fairview will jointly manage and govern the four academic facilities. The transition would conclude with the university assuming full ownership and governance of UMMC no later than December 31, 2027. During this process, the university will also begin planning for a new academic health facility as a critical component of meeting Minnesota's health needs and fulfilling the role of the UMMC. While this letter of intent is, is a critical first step, Important conversations around the long term and the agreement between our organizations will need to occur. Those details will be part of the definitive agreement. Here's what we know now about the letter of intent and what it impacts. First, we will remain focused on providing the high quality and innovative care Minnesotans expect. Nothing will change during this year for our patients, our care teams, or our employees at any of our facilities as a result of the letter of intent. No changes to employment or what we call employment homes are anticipated as we work towards the definitive agreement and the subsequent regulatory approvals for shared governance of the UMMC. Staff will continue to work in their current role as part of their current employment homes. We are committed to working collaboratively with staff on any transitions of employment home necessary during the transition period as we approach full ownership anticipated, as I mentioned, by December 31, 2027. Our shared mutual goal will be a seamless experience, both for our patients and staff, as ownership changes. I want to emphasize that our vision for academic health acknowledges that future developments must involve proper protections for worker rights, expanded opportunities, and job growth. As we all know, the healthcare sector continues to expand and improve. We must ensure the protection of workers' rights and adherence to current labor contracts as of paramount importance to our cultivate a culture of trust and respect among our dedicated healthcare professionals and guarantee the continuity of vital health services. And it bears repeating that our five-point vision for an academic health system includes a new state-of-the-art hospital owned and operated by the university. Innovative and functional space is a is essential for our talented staff, faculty, and students to continue their groundbreaking research and complex care training and delivery. With a signed letter of intent, we can begin this planning in earnest. We know that this letter of intent leaves many questions unanswered. Conversations among Fairview, the university, and UMP will continue as we work towards an eventual transition of UMMC ownership to the university. This letter of intent is a first crucial step in charting the future path for these organizations. We are committed to working collaboratively with our teams and sharing information with you and the public as we work toward building our new and exciting future. And along with uh, Dean Toller uh, and myself and Interim President Ettinger, we're ready to take questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, is there, uh, let me just say that the resolution that we're, uh, I'm seeking a motion on is now in the uh, revised board materials at page 126, along with the uh, proposed, with the letter of intent. So I refer my colleagues to uh, page 126 of the board materials. With that in mind, is there a motion to approve the resolution related to the non-binding letter of intent with Fairview Health Services? I'll move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Regent Gully. Thank you both so much, and thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to say that I'm excited about this possibility. I think that this will be an excellent opportunity for the university, but more importantly, I think it'll be a better way to serve the people who come to the University of Minnesota for care. 
And so I'm excited about the possibility. Um, uh, there is one thing that's very important to me, which is uh, shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. <laughs> I want to make sure that there is continuity for our um, represented folks in these clinics um, and that their pensions aren't affected, that their seniority isn't affected, that, they're, uh, that there's continuity in the way that they work in the, in the, in the hospitals and clinics. So for me, that's the most important thing <laughs> that I don't want to lose sight of. Um, and the other thing is, as we consider the costs with taking this over, I think that we have a real opportunity to see this as a way that we serve Minnesotans. Um, but I also think that we are taking a lot of the liability from Fairview, and we should keep that in mind when we're talking about uh, the cost <laughs> to us for taking this over. Um, and I think, you know, Fairview should keep that in mind <laughs> as well. Um, but I, I think that ultimately we can do a better job. Um, I think this will be a, this will be a positive thing for serving our, our state and our community. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you Regent Gully. Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. I really just have two things to say, um, and they're both thanks and appreciation. Um, as I'm not on the Special Committee on Academic Health and have just kind of been watching this on the side as someone who doesn't have a lot of um, professional expertise to bring to this realm. And, and with that said, just want to express deep appreciation to everyone who's been a lot closer to this um, than I have. Uh, as Senior Vice President Fran said it well from a teamwork perspective, um, all the people that have uh, touched this issue Issue, whether it was regents who are doing the special committee work, the administration, um, subject matter experts, kind of everyone who's got us to this point, um, which leads me into the second point, which Regent Gully just mentioned a little bit, um, about how all of this is grounded in service to the state, um, in service to our mission, and um, it's much more uh, than the center of it, which is healthcare del delivery, which is incredibly important um, for so many reasons, but this has such broader impacts. And so today is exciting uh, when I just, I personally switched jobs recently and I was um, signing up for my insurance in the University of Minnesota and Fairview is my network provider and I think North Memorial too, Regent Turner. Um, but um, it, it's very, it became even more personal um, to me when I was doing that and um, knowing that um, my family has had great care here and then um, it becoming very direct to me recently um, that was kind of a cool moment too so this um, this is really critical moment for the state there's a lot as um, our presenters just talked about obviously a lot of things to figure out a lot of unknowns left to come but want to thank everyone for where we are at this point and looking forward to continuing to support it so thank you thank you very much Regent Farnsworth I do want to say, and then we'll call on Regent Verhill, and that part of this team was also uh, the expertise and counsel from the OGC's office, in particular, General Counsel Peterson, who was always part of this team as well to, to try and navigate what have been very difficult and complex negotiations. So I do want to thank him and his role with this process as well. And with that, uh, Regent Verhill. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, I have three questions. The first is, did you both plan on wearing the same tie today? <laughs> <laughs> I tried to be like uh, Chair uh, Mayron. I tried to be like him in all aspects, except hair. I didn't get the memo about the blue. <laughs> I had to immediately check and see if Interim President Ettinger was wearing the same tie. No, yes. you yeah. didn't get the memo either. I'm a rebel. <laughs> With a cause. Yeah. Uh, so reading through this letter of intent, non-binding but really sets forth the groundwork for what's to come for the parties and something that really strikes me is the september 30th 2024 date it's not that far away um, and really it's structured in that the definitive agreements are intended to be negotiated and in a form presentable to the three parties governing bodies and the minnesota attorney general by then for review to make sure that everything's in compliance with regulatory, but also that every governing body is comfortable with what the definitive agreements look like. And the, the question I have is, no one has a vacation plan between now and then, right? Because the, I mean, this is a lot of work mm -hmm. to occur. And obviously there can be some adjustments, amendments in writing to extend timeframes for a small period of time if necessary. But 
what what is next um, to to really achieve that September twenty twenty four date. Yeah. Chair Mayor uh, Regent Ray Helen, uh, it's a it's a it's a question that we all have on our um, you know frontal cortex all the time. The timing. I can put it in the perspective. The the initial definitive agreement that we negotiated in 2017 uh, between uh, the teams took nine months, and so so this is sort of in the ballpark of where we were then. And it was uh, I would argue a little more complicated than, than it is today. I take full responsibility for starting absolutely right now, and we already have plans for the meetings next week. We will start the work streams next week. We had five of them uh, last time. We probably have a fewer more this time, but we are very clear that we need to accomplish the due diligence. We need to get the data. Uh, that we that we don't have at the moment to really look on your behalf at the feasibility of all of this uh, coming together and then with clear eyes and clear mind come in front of you and share with you what is the next step. Um, Madam Chair, I might add, yeah, thank you. It's a great question and thank you, Dean Toller. I think one of the, as Chair Mayron mentioned, uh, 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 Doug Peterson in the OGC office, um, one of the things that will be critical will be uh, working through the due diligence aspect as, as a lawyer. I know you've been through that and understand that. So we're lucky or fortunate to have uh, really talented consultants that support us as well with Cliff Stromberg and uh, Hogan Ho Hovel uh, firm and, uh, and other folks will be contributing to this. So a lot of this due diligence um, uh, activity will be uh, supported somewhat from the outside. We don't have the infrastructure internally to do to do this. So, uh, but you're right; those streams need to begin running immediately. And uh, uh, there's a lot, a lot of work to get done between now and, and September 30. Uh, some of the regulatory approval we think will come after that. Uh, but but certainly these bod the the boards of uh, the university and UMP and Fairview will have to approve those at that time. But I think you're right that. The, the work stream of the due diligence to this, uh, this kind of a letter of intent is intense. And then my last question Sorry. very briefly, um, to a comment you both just made, are you getting the information you need thinking back to our prior conversations? Or are you comfortable that you are getting, that the, the sharing of information is occurring as necessary versus some of our prior conversations around this relationship? Chair Mayron, uh, Regent Ray Helen, uh, not yet. Simply put, you know, this LOI is in fact a path to get the information that we need. Mm -hmm. And we are prepared, again, on your behalf and with your guidance to be firm but pragmatic and really get to the data that we need. Thank you. Anything further? No, thank you, Chair Mayron. I just want to comment before I call on Regent Ruth Johnson that the uh, most read article in the STRIB right now is the University of Minnesota intends to buy teaching hospital from Fairview. <laughs> so you can see, I think, uh, is certainly in the metro area, but I would say statewide, there is enormous interest in this topic. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Regent Ruth Johnson. Thank you, Chair, Chair Mayron. Uh, I just want to say, first of all, I'm delighted to, that we're at this point where we have the letter of intent to discuss and we approve. Um, and then some of this, we had a, a brief conversation yesterday at, but, uh, at the Academic Health Committee, but we're not all part of that committee. Just to say, as we go forward in this process, obviously we need to communicate with the state of Minnesota, our, our citizens, our residents, with the legislature, because in order to accomplish what we need, we're going to need their support. Mm -hmm. for the buildings and, and the whole enterprise. So that as we do that, I would just uh, encourage us uh, in our communications to be very clear. I think we need to state that the University of Minnesota Medical Center is the state of Minnesota's public academic health center. And then all that that means for the citizens of Minnesota um, for their care. And uh, I think that's a, a wonderful message. And that's something that we and work with our legislators who have to, we have to convince to support this and who have to be able to go home to their districts and say, this is really important. Uh, we want you, you know, we want you to support this because this is going to provide excellent care for any and all citizens of Minnesota. And so I think just that communication piece as we move forward, I think is really important and just encourage you to 
you know, pursue that in that manner. Chairman Iran, uh, Regent Johnson, thank you very much. You know, I re remember well, you know, your comment yesterday about the pyramid where the storytelling is on the top and related to Regent Farnsworth and Regent Gully, comment on how personal it is. It is. Everything in medicine that I know is personal. We know this from ourselves and our loved ones, and we know this as a clinician, and uh, I think that that enables us to share genuine stories, the real stories, mm -hmm. and really permeate this with the innovation that uh, uh, that the university environment, six health science schools, college of engineering, and so forth, can uniquely provide in, in, in that service. And in that process, I think that we are also building a business ecology, and it's also a moral ecology as a collective response to big problems like inequity, like access, like cost, because nobody else will be as effective as we can be. Madam. Just, thank you, and just one quick follow-up on that. We just talked a little bit about a pyramid yep. concept where um, we certainly, research is very important. That's kind of, in a sense, at the bottom foundational, but some of these other imperatives that we came away from the governor's task force with about, you know, the, the underserved, uh, primary care, all those things that we're going to, they're kind of in that pyramid in there. And I think as we communicate that to, again, the citizens of Minnesota, legislator, I, th later, I think that's going to be very effective. Thank you. Regent Wheeler? Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Mayron, and thank you very much uh, going forward. Uh, I I uh, really appreciate that every focus here is on what is what are the needs of Minnesotans and how does the university best serve those needs. So appreciate that. On the task force, as you can see in the task force report, there there was a bold language, like you know, bold font about have the university move forward in a productive way to serve Minnesotans with this relationship with Fairview. So I appreciate the movement and the framework uh, that's that's here. And uh, I appreciate also, and I'm supportive of the non-binding letter of intent because we have to get the requisite information we need, to your point, Dean Toller, to really understand what it will take, mm -hmm. what it will mean to people, what it will mean to the people who care, and what resources are needed to do this. So I'm, I'm supportive of that. As you can imagine, as a physician and as a healthcare leader and being a member of the task force, I have a lot of big questions uh, that uh, I think remain to be answered until we get the requisite information. And I guess I would I would say to the board members, I just want to make sure during this due diligence period that we assure that we have the right expertise around the table mm -hmm. um, to be able to negotiate it uh, appropriately, uh, given the economic modeling that will have to be done, given the operational transition, which will be a very big lift, um, given the compliance and regulatory environment that sits around healthcare, and then the infrastructure. You you know, and how that transitions um, as well. So we have a lot to, to sort through. So the definitive agreement, you know, once it's reached, that's a big piece of work. But the work that follows that is huge. Um, so I think we have to be mindful of that and make sure that we have the right uh, uh, council and transition planning going forward. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Senior Vice President France. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, Regent, uh, we are really great points. You know, you're, thinking like a board should, but also like a credit rating, a rating agency will think. I mean, part of what our ability will need to be able to stand this up and, and prove that the economic model, the operating model, the, the uh, substantive support is there uh, for their view, because they will, uh, there will be debt associated with this kind of a deal. And so uh, we look at the same sort of facts for them. As, so it's this whole paradigm of, of showing the progress and the thought and the economic modeling is critical going forward. Thank you for those comments. Just one additional comment, and I will, I will thank you, um, Senior Vice President Franz, for staying on, because you've been a thread throughout these negotiations. To have your view and your continued consultation on this is critical to us, so thank you. I, I also want to share to the administration, to this whole team, that the board is behind you in making sure that you have the expertise that you need to address all of the various components that Regent Wheeler set out. We're on a fast timeline, but we got to make sure that, uh, that you all have every uh, opportunity and support and information to help the administration present this to in a final form. 
So I think you need to know that we're fully behind you on this. And if that means retaining outsiders or consultants or uh, people with very specialized expertise in this area, we are, we're going to have to do that or it will not come to pass. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Anything further, President Ettinger, that you want to add before we uh, vote on the resolution? No, we appreciate the support of the board and, and we, you have our full recommendation. <clears throat> All right, uh, any further discussion or questions? Uh, all right, then at this point, we will entertain the motion. All those in favor of approving the resolution related to the non-binding letter of intent with Fairview Health Services, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion is approved. I want to thank Interim President Ettinger and everyone on his team for the tremendous work involved in getting us to this point. But to be honest, I, I was very concerned, say, a year ago. And I do remember even when I came on as a regent, knowing that we had these deadlines looming and that we were going to have to make a decision by uh, the end of 2023 about our, the continued relationship with Fairview. I remember going on a walk uh, with uh, Senior Vice President Franz and talking about, well, what if we can't Saw, you know, it doesn't work with them. Where are we going to go from here? I, I will personally say I am absolutely thrilled that you all have gotten us to where we are and what we can look forward to in the future. As we all know, securing the future of our health sciences programs and serving the people of Minnesota are the board's highest priorities. And now uh, I believe you'll be stepping away to handle media questions on the letter of intent while we continue our meeting. And I'm referring to either uh, President Ettinger or the team. Uh, enjoy yourself. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Madam Chair, you were concerned a year ago. I was concerned last week. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. All right. That brings us to our committee business. And we're going to start first with the Audit and Compliance Committee report. Regent Farnsworth, please share your report with us. Thank you, Chair Mayron. The Audit and Compliance Committee did not discuss any or did not consider any action items this month. First, the committee heard about completed audit work performed by the university's external auditors, Deloitte, since the December 2023 meeting. Five additional FY 2023 compliance audits and agreed upon procedures and reports have been completed. I'd also like to do a final thank you in front of the whole board to Deloitte for their services since April 2010. Um, yesterday was their last engagement with the university as we switch over to our new auditors. For our second item, the committee turned to FY 2024 and received an overview of the external audit plan. That plan will be used by the university's new external audit firm, Clifton Larson Allen LLP, when they complete the FY 2024 financial and compliance audits. In our third item, Chief Auditor Galswick provided the committee with a brief internal audit update, reporting that 37% of the outstanding recommend recommendations rated as essential were resolved by university departments. This is slightly lower than the expected implementation rate of 40% and a drop from October's 38% rate. The committee also received an information item regarding an engagement less than $100,000, which required after the fact reporting with two external auditors. Thank you, Chair Mayron. That concludes my report. Thank you very much, Regent Farnsworth. Next, we will receive the reports of the Mission Fulfillment and Finance and Operation Committees. These reports will note, uh, their reports will note that those items the committee is approved on behalf of the board. We'll start first with the Mission Fulfillment Committee. Regent Ruth Johnson, your report, please. Thank you, Chair Mayron. The Mission Fulfillment Committee approved one action item this month, the consent report, which includes academic program changes, the conferral of tenure, and the Bell Museum collection management policy. There are no other action items approved this month. Thank you, Chair Mayron. That concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Johnson. For Finance and Operations, Regent Wheeler, your report, please. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Uh, the Finance and Operations Committee met and approved three items on behalf of the board. Those items were an amendment to the university's supplemental fiscal year 25 state budget request. The second was the consent report, which included one central reserves general contingency allocation, five purchases of goods and services over $1 million, four capital budget amendments, 
two employment agreements and one real estate purchase and three schematic designs. And third, an amendment to the employment agreement for Twin Cities Athletic Director Mark Coyle. There were no other actions items approved this month. Thank you very much, Chair Mayron. This concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Wheeler. For Governance and Policy Committee, Regent Fairhill, in your report, please. Thank you, Chair Mayron. The Governance and Policy Committee did not consider any action items this month. The committee reviewed proposed amendments to two board policies. The first discussion focused on proposed amendments to the Board of Regents policy, reservation and delegation of authority. The policy is currently under comprehensive review and the proposed amendments are in response to previous committee discussions. The changes will adjust the board's various approval thresholds to ensure the board's ability to carry out its fiduciary and oversight duties while focusing on consequential items. Based on the committee discussion, the results of those discussions and conferring with Chair Mayron, the policy will come to the full board at the March meeting for your review. The second item reviewed amendments to Board of Regents policy institutional conflict of interest relating to how the board will handle potential institutional conflicts of interest involving the president. The proposed amendments create a new as needed presidential conflict review panel that will be appointed by the board chair and it will be independent from the current university process. This item will come to the full board at the March meeting for review and action. The third agenda item was a continuation of discussion on board committee structure. The committee will pause this discussion for now as we, the whole board, can see how our current structure is working with the two special committees. The plan is to engage in a discussion in July to consider the current board structure and provide an opportunity for a new president to also provide their thoughts. Based on that discussion, the committee will then take up the topic again next fall and move forward with an updated structure. The committee also received an information item reporting a referral of motion to the Governance and Policy Committee by this board at the December 2023 meeting. Thank you, Chair Mayor, on that concludes my report. Thank you very much, Regent Fairhalen. For the Litigation Review Committee, Regent Tad Johnson, your report, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Litigation Review Committee met on December 14th, 2023 and January 19th, 2024. At these meetings, we adopted a resolution that authorized the closing of the meetings to discuss matters subject to the attorney-client privilege. Thank you, Chair Mayron. That concludes my report. Thank you very much, uh, Regent Johnson. Now we'll turn to our special committees. We'll start with the Special Committee on Academic Health. Regent Wheeler, would you share your report? Thank you, Chair Mayron. The Special Committee on Academic Health uh, met yesterday and did not consider any action items this month. Interim President Edinger, Vice President Toller, Dean Connie Delaney and I provided the special committee with a summary of the final report of the Governor's Task Force on Academic Health at the University. The conversation outlined the key recommendations of the report and some first steps the unity university can take, both on our own and with support from the state. That includes a supplemental budget request which Finance and Operations Committee approved yesterday. The board will continue to consider how the university advances the task force recommendations at our March meeting and I look forward to engaging with you all on the topic then. Thank you, Chair Mayron. That concludes my report. Thank you very much, Regent Wheeler. And finally, the Special Committee on University Relations, Regent Gully, your report, please. Thank you, Chair. The Special Committee on University Relations did not consider any action items this month. Our fourth meeting as a special committee started with an update on government relations with Executive Director Melissa Lopez Franzen. And for our second item, Chief Public Relations Officer Tom Bridge. Homeward shared an overview of public relations and internal communications at the university. Um, finally, the committee learned about best practices in public relations and internal communications within higher ed. Thank you, Chair. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just say to all of my colleagues, um, one of the uh, uh, ways that our committee structure is set up is there are certain committees or special committees that we can't all attend. And again, I encourage all of you, uh, if you didn't have an opportunity to review their materials uh, in advance of the meeting, I encourage you to do so and to watch the live stream uh, to the extent it's available of those special committees so you can get a flavor of uh, what each of those committees was addressing as well. Uh, that concludes our committee reports and brings us to old business. Is there any old business to come before the board? 
Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, we will now take a short break before moving into our final agenda item, which is the presidential selection process. Uh, we will plan on resuming at, uh, let's say, um, a, to give you an extra five minutes, 11.05 a.m., all right? Thank you.
Switch. All right. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that was good. That was good. That was, All right. that was good. All right. <laughs> yes, I sir. call this meeting back to order. For our final agenda item, we will discuss the four candidates who were recommended by the Presidential Search Advisory Committee in the search for the university's 18th president. Let me say we all know as regents when we came on board and it was we applied for the position, we were all told and we fully understand that one of the most important, if not the most important decision we make is the hiring of a president. And we're about to embark on that process now. I think we are all very excited by the uh, prospect of going through this process. We have four fantastic candidates, I will say. And with that, uh, before I uh, describe the process for today's selection and we discuss the candidates, I'd like to invite my colleague, Regent Mary Davenport, who chaired the Presidential Search Advisory Committee, to share information on the process that led to the committee's recommendation of the four lead candidates. Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Mayron. I was honored to chair the advisory committee along with Vice Chair Professor Yugen and honored to get to know each member over the last several months. The committee members and I enjoyed the time we spent together engaging with students, faculty, staff, alumni, and others in the community, whether at the listening sessions held on each campus or in the many meetings in person and Zoom with campus governance leaders, global alumni, university retirees, and our state legislative leaders and others. What we learned is that each of us may have different connections to the university, but we all share a deep commitment and a true love for this great institution. As we turn to reviewing applications, I can say that the advisory committee members and I were thoroughly impressed with the high quality of the pool the full pool of candidates. The group was diligent and thoughtful in its work. And when reviewing applicants, we listened with open minds, debated respectfully, and worked collectively to select candidates for further advancement in the process. We then came together and unanimously supported the four candidates who are under our consideration today. We are very excited to be at this stage in the process, and our lead candidates may indeed be tuned in and listening. So I want to say again, this is an excellent university with many exciting strengths and legacies from which to build upon for an incoming leader to, to really build and move us into the future. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to thank each of the members of the Presidential Search Advisory Committee. On behalf of myself and my board colleagues, I want to extend our deepest gratitude for the many volunteer hours that the advisory committee members spent listening to students, faculty, staff, alumni, and other constituents around the state. For the group's excellent work in shaping the position profile and for the thorough and careful review of the applicant pool to develop the recommendations we have before us today. This was no simple undertaking, and the committee's diligence throughout the entire process is laudable and much appreciated. I will also say that uh, to the extent I've had the opportunity to encounter one or more of the members of the committee, apart from our regents are on it, the feedback I received from those members was that this was probably one of the best committees they've ever been on and best process they've ever been able to engage in. So um, it went both ways. We're highly appreciative of what the work they did, 
but at least to the extent of those who I spoke to, they were highly appreciative of being able to be involved in the process. With the search committee's recommendation, the board's charge to the advisory committee has been formally completed. And that brings us to the agenda item where the board will review the recommended candidates and select finalists to interview, to invite for interviews. Before we get to that discussion, I would like to share a few brief remarks on the process and confidentiality as required by Minnesota law. So first, let me address confidentiality. As you all recall from the interim president search, the process and conversation may, to say it the least, feel a little bit awkward. While this board is required to hold all our meetings and deliberate in public, all applicants are legally entitled to confidentiality until they are named as finalists. As a result, we will discuss candidates in a de-identified manner. Each candidate has been assigned a letter and we will refer to them by those letters throughout the meeting. Candidates A, B, C, and D. Please use the candidate D identification table that has been provided to each of you. It's in the uh, maroon um, folder, says confidential on it. This is a reminder to you that we must avoid discussing any identifiable information such as job titles, current or former employers, or any unique aspects of the candidate's background. I would ask that each of you use the term they or them or their pronouns for each applicant or refer to it as the candidate and avoid talking about it in terms of gender. I recognize this is going to make our conversation more stilted than we are used to, but I want to thank you in advance for your careful adherence to this legal requirement. <clears throat> now let me address the process. This is the process we will use to get to a decision on who we want to interview. Phase one of the process will, is what I call the general remarks by each region of each candidate. So first of all, within phase one, we will each share our respective thoughts on the strengths and characteristics that draw us to each candidate. Each region will be given up to four minutes for this part of the exercise to cover all four candidates. We will start first with the regions who served on the search advisory committee before inviting the rest of the board to comment. Next, we will each share what we are curious about, want to explore, or find concerning about each candidate. Each region will be given up to four minutes for this part of the exercise to cover all four candidates. And similar to the last round of discussion, we will start with the members of the search advisory committee and then make our way around the horseshoe. At the end of this phase, and before we talk about uh, what comes next, let me just say, if you don't have something you want to share, for example, you don't find anything of concern or curious about at this stage, you don't have to say something just for the sake of some, saying something. So these are the things that what we're trying to get here is what is at the top of your mind in terms of what you're drawn to by way of a candidate and what you may find concerning or want more information about um, with respect to any particular candidate. And I also want to share with you, if you hear your fellow regent uh, say something about a candidate and you identified those characteristics as well, share them so that we begin to see where we're starting to see consensus about how uh, people are looking at particular candidates. Don't shy away. Don't feel like you need to say something different. Again, the whole point of this is to get at your thinking based on what you've read so far which is all about what we're seeing in the materials, written materials, draws you to a candidate or maybe uh, what you're curious about or causes you concern. At the end of this phase, and this will, uh, as I said, we've got four minutes to talk about what we're drawn to and four minutes to talk about we may, what we may have concerns about. Any region can ask any other region for clarification of what that region said about any particular candidate. However, as, as part of this part of the process, we're not gonna engage in the back and forth discussion. 
about the candidates. That will come later. So this is the point. If you need clarification about what re one region or another said, then you can indicate, raise your hand, and we'll <laughs> take up those points of clarification. I understand that some of you may feel hesitant to share your views in this setting. However, given the importance of the decision, it is vital for each of us and each of our voice to be heard in today's discussion and that we consider the viewpoints of our colleagues. The next phase is what I refer to as the dot exercise. Following this first phase, we will uh, proceed to a preference exercise. And similar to what we did in the interim presidential search, we will use dot polling. You each have been given or you will be given an allocation of two dot stickers. Do they have them yet or they, oh, we have them? Are they in our folder? Yep, they are. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you have your two dots in your folder. And what you will do uh, with those two dots is uh, with the uh, reminder that this is not to say that only two finalists will advance to be interviewed. Rather, the point of this exercise is to help discern whether the board's preferences are leaning, where we're starting to lean. Do we have any um, indication? I also want to share with you that even if one person, in theory, received the bulk of the dots uh, as we go through the dot exercise, we're not, that is not to suggest that's the only person we want to interview. Again, we're, what we're looking for here is trends and, and to get, start to get a sense of what our colleagues are thinking of. Please apply your dots to the two individuals you most believe should be selected for interview with the regents for the position. You must use both your dots and you can only use one dot per applicant. That is, you can't withhold using your dots and you can't use both dots on one applicant, no piling on of two dots on one applicant. As for those regions who are attending remotely, uh, Regent Hipsch and uh, Regent uh, Talrabi, Executive Director Brian Steves uh, uh, will receive your text as to where you would like your dots placed, and then he will place them on the uh, boards behind us. The third phase of the discussion is we will then uh, engage in a robust discussion of our four candidates. I mean, we can all go look at where we're seeing some, if we're starting to see some consensus, but the point is at phase three, we're not gonna focus at this point on any particular candidate, but we will engage in a very robust discussion of the four candidates in, in terms of what each of you are thinking or why you're drawn to a particular candidate for interview or perhaps why you're not. At phase four, we will see if consensus is emerging based on the discussion uh, as to which candidates to advance for interview. And we'll either do this based on the discussion that just preceded the robust discussion, or we'll go back and use the two dot exercise again that we used in phase two to see if we can, if we're getting a sense of that where we're landing with respect to the four candidates. Phase five will be uh, where we take motions. Uh, so once we as a group are satisfied that consensus has been reached on which candidates to advance for interview, I'll welcome motions either candidate by candidate or by uh, a motion to move the entire slate of candidates that we can see we have consensus on. And then we'll vote. And we will use a roll call vote for these motions. With that, uh, let me ask, are there any questions that anyone may have about process? All right. Hearing none, uh, with that, we will move to phase one of the process where each of you will share the characteristics that draw you to each candidate in uh, a space of four minutes or less. I will start with the regents who served on the search advisory committee before inviting the rest of the board to comment. Proceeding alphabetically, Regent Davenport, would you like to share your thoughts? These are on what drew you to each of the four candidates. Yes, thank you, Chair Mayron. While each candidate is truly unique, there are commonalities different in expression. The commonalities, I believe, are characteristic skills and attributes that are aligned with the listening sessions, what we heard, 
and the position profile, what we said. These are all strong candidates. So let me start with candidate A, highlight attributes, um, but not limited. Their attributes include, but are not limited. A top level university portfolio. Leads a complex environment, leverages interdisciplinary work. Highly collaborative, strong relationship builder. Highly respected within the stakeholder community. Experienced with strategic planning and thinking. Values shared governance. Regularly interacts and promotes higher education within the community and with policy makers. Attuned to students and student needs. Good energy, lots of passion, and affinity with Minnesota. Candidate B, a top level university administrative position, strong research and scholarship, collaborative leadership, values shared governance, leadership skills built from working within a highly complex and often fast, stressful environment, mission focused in strategic planning, prioritizing and budgeting, attuned to building healthy learning and workplaces as related to belonging and mental health, engaging smart affinity with Minnesota. Candidate C, top level university portfolio, interacts with policymakers attuned to student needs, leads within an enterprise of higher ed entities, highly collaborative relationship builder, value shared governance, strong research and scholarship, interdisciplinary approaches, strong budgeting experience with different models, experience with strategic planning, attentive to multiple stakeholders, engaging deep higher ed knowledge and expertise as evidence, uh, excellent work with stakeholder groups, including tribal nations, engaging, um, good rapport, affinity for Minnesota. And candidate D, top level university position, leads in a highly collaborative manner, strong research and scholarship, creative, strategic planning experience, value shared governance, relationship builder, looks at interactive networks, including policymakers, high energy, bold vision, engaging, and an infinity with Minnesota. Thank you very much. I will now move to Regent Farnsworth to share uh, what draws you to each of the four candidates, four minutes or less. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Regent Davenport set the bar high, and I agree with a lot of what you said, so I'll try not to, well, no, we can, can repeat, repeat. Right, right. Yes. never mind, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to begin my comments today with adding my um, quick and but personal heartfelt thanks and deep appreciation to the members of the Presidential Search Committee. It was really an honor and a privilege to serve alongside my colleagues, Regent Ruth Johnson and Regent Davenport, as well as the students, faculty, staff, alumni, and community members on the committee. Um, I know many of them are watching today or may even be here. I haven't looked around fully yet. Um, their hours of dedication, reflection, and due diligence were absolutely critical to getting where we are today. So it was a really incredible committee to be on. Um, I also want to take advantage of this moment to continue to strongly affirm the process in which we're engaging in and just really echo Regent Davenport's remarks. Um, her leadership along with OBR, our search firm, have really been rooted in engagement, transparency, and collaboration. And I think it's especially important to note that our process has been able to pivot when needed to even more strongly embrace those aforementioned uh, mentioned values. So I have no reason to believe that that won't continue to happen through our final vote um, on a new president. So now about the candidates specifically. We are very lucky to have this exceptionally qualified group of candidates in front of us today for consideration. And um, I think as we'll hear, each candidate brings unique strengths and opportunities to such an important position. So. Um, candidate A, I view this candidate as someone who has, who has a demonstrated record of bringing people together and forming deep and authentic relationships, which contributes to a healthy and proud university culture. I was impressed by this candidate's approach to government and media relations, which are two top priorities of this board as outlined in the position description. It's also clear to me, based on this candidate's background, that they would be an especially strong partner to us and one of the core responsibilities they'll need to start on right away when they get here, which is the development of a new strategic plan for the university. 
Candidate B, this candidate would bring a uniquely relevant background to assist in addressing some of the major topics facing our university. Um, I found them to be energetic, optimistic, and innovative. Um, and I believe based on that, that they would make strong contributions in the area of strategic thinking, strategic <laughs> planning, and the navigation of complex challenges facing the university. Um, also really embracing uh, the university's full approach to research, teaching, and outreach reach. Candidate C, I would characterize this candidate as a steady and humble leader. They have expertise in a broad portfolio of items in line with the profile we posted to recruit for this position. I imagine them functioning in this role as someone who could inspire confidence and trust from a wide uh, range of stakeholders. And I believe that trust building and reputation management are, of course, very important elements of this role. Finally, candidate D, uh, this candidate is extremely energetic and outgoing. When looking through my own lens on the role of the president, the ability to form relationships, help lead on strategy, and be an effective influencer and convener of many different stakeholders and constituencies are really important tenets that come to mind. And I believe this candidate would certainly uh, meet and very oftentimes exceed those pieces. I would also um, emphasize their unique understanding of important DEI challenges and opportunities specifically facing students. Um, that concludes my initial comments. And I look forward to hearing from others. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Thank you very much. Regent Ruth Johnson. Thank you, Chair Mayron. And uh, as a third person here, I will strongly endorse and echo what uh, my colleagues, Regents Davenport and Farnsworth, have said about the process the committee, our other members. I won't repeat it, but uh, it was a wonderful experience and uh, we're delighted to be at this place now. So with regard to candidate A, they build great relationships, have, they have experience in urban locations, they've done excellent DEI, JB work in very diverse populations. They strongly support first generation and low income student populations. They have been creative and, and providing housing options for single parents with children. And interestingly, I think I've created partnerships outside the university with academic uh, medical centers, with businesses and so on, in, which have provided for their students uh, internships, educational and job opportunities. They also understand systemness and the uh, practice of having multiple campuses. And I think, again, they understand the culture in which we, re we reside. Okay, candidate B. So dynamic, high energy, motivating individual, outstanding research, greater than 200 publications, deep understanding of critical campus issues regarding things like substance abuse and opioids, have survived, that they have survived and led during multiple significant campus transitions and staff turnover, a bit very engaging personality, outgoing, uh, excellent kind of a triple threat in terms of education, research, and administration expertise. They have uh, created international outreach programs in Europe and Africa, among others, and they have long experience in a large research university. Candidate C. They have excellent communication skills, the engaging personality with genuine warmth. They have the capacity to win people over, a <clears throat> type of positive persuasion, skilled at team building, logical analytical processes. Uh, they excel. They've demonstrated good strategic thinking, the ability to delegate, and to be supportive of their teams. And finally, candidate D. They have an incisive mind and are innovative in their work. They are dynamic, highly energetic as a persona. They have capacity for empathy. They're skilled in persuading and influencing their colleagues. They have a record of commitment to DEI and manifests in their teams. They are consensus builders. They open themselves to their own further development and they are proven result getters. That concludes my comments at this stage. Thank you very much, Regent Johnson. Starting with, we're gonna go around the horseshoe, I'm gonna go last, uh, just so I can manage the process. We'll start with Regent Gully. 
Goodness, uh, I sincerely appreciate the insights from our colleagues that were on the um, committee. Um, I've read over all of the materials and it is, I think, hard to get a sense of the, of the people who are coming in without having experienced them as, as people. So I, I think those insights are incredibly valuable. Um, what I loved about all of the candidates was that they all had strong administrative experience in um, system wide campus in system wide university institutions, and so um, they all of them had come from teaching research um, service backgrounds and then gone into administration. And so I think all four candidates for me were very strong in that way. Um, what I particularly appreciated about candidate A was their strong connection to the University of Minnesota already. Um, and their f I, um, from reading their materials and watching some things that they had, that they had posted online, um, there, I gathered their uh, philosophy on higher education as a public good, on bringing people together, on having strong relationships with our outside community and external partners, um, uh, on being innovative with bringing in students and um, wanting to gather a, a, you know, opinions and ideas and input from stakeholders across institutions. Um, what I really appreciated about candidate B was their extensive experience and growing responsibility at a university that's similar to ours. Um, I know they also had <coughs> ties to the University of Minnesota, but um, had long experience in a peer institution, uh, which I think could bring a real fresh perspective to our work. Um, we had very strong communication philosophies based on stakeholder input, um, close work with faculty governance. Uh, I think that they could bring a fresh set of eyes to the work that we do and bring some of the things that they've experienced at, a, at one of our peer institutions to uh, our university. Um, and they appear to be strongly collaborative and talked about that a lot. Um, uh, candidate C has, again, extensive experience in higher education, escalating responsibility in a system-wide um, university with multiple campuses, um, has, is a seasoned academic and administrator, um, has led strategic planning processes, and has a strong record on research and scholarship. And then finally, candidate D also has a University of Minnesota connection um, and uh, has, I think, stayed in touch with the University of Minnesota, even having left to go to another institution, um, has a very strong research and academic background, um, strong statements on DEI, and a lot of experience at um, uh, in DEI on an institutional level. So um, yeah. I really appreciate the opportunity, but I but I particularly appreciated hearing from the folks who have had a chance to spend time with the candidates. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Chair. Regent Tad Johnson. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, I also want to thank the the three regents that served on this, uh, and uh, especially uh, Chair Mayron, who um, clearly I talked to. I had a Person I knew. I think you meant Chair Davenport. Chair, Chair Davenport. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. I'm, yeah. Um, uh, anyway, uh, a person on the committee told me it was one of the best committees they had ever served on. So um, an atmosphere of of, uh, of collegiality was uh, was uh, permeating throughout the committee. So that was nice uh, to hear. Um, so um, candidate A. Um, as has been mentioned, good connections with the state and, um, um, you know, very good leadership skills, um, building, good at building a relationship and the, um, uh, and has worked in the shared government type of atmosphere and, um, uh, I, has done great outreach as far as diversity uh, matters. Um, candidate B um, uh, 
work their way through a um, excellent institution um, all the way, uh, climbed the ladder there and and um, um, had, had a fabulous academic background and leadership um, qualities. Um, candidate C, um, um, based on uh, what I observed about their writing, um, must be um, um, extraordinarily bright. Um, but a, a word I don't often see in university um, matters, and, and actually uh, uh, Regent Farnsworth said this, but it was also in the report, um, humble. Um, and we don't see much of that. Um, and um, uh, and it is it forms relationship with uh, with the Native American governments where they are, and that that makes a difference for me. Uh, and um, the last uh, candidate uh, D, um, uh, what I kept coming across was highly energetic and outgoing and. Um, um, anyway, they, they are four excellent candidates, and I really am grateful for the, the winnowing down that was done. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Perhala. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, echoing what's been said to now, um, but really highlighting <clears throat> for candidate A, the leadership and experience at both urban and greater state institutions. That perspective is important, considering how our system campuses are, are spread out. Um, that, in, that experience is including a large research institution and uh, good involvement with the shared governance models that are important uh, to this university. Um, Regent Johnson mentioned some of the unique initiatives that this individual has really led on, um, and also their unique ties to Minnesota were of interest to me. And then um, the fact that this, this individual has really led at multiple levels um, and in, some, in, a, in a variety of environments. Uh, candidate B, uh, their, their strength as well in a large research institution um, and a history of leadership levels within that institution. Um, so to Regent Johnson's point, um, seeing, some, seeing an institution from a lot of different perspectives is helpful. Um, and then they have and I'm, I can't remember exactly how you phrased it, but I would agree with it, uh, a unique perspective for some of the challenges and opportunities um, for the University of Minnesota in, in future years. Um, that was intriguing. And then candidate C, again, a humbleness, but really notable leadership across a variety of um, not only positions, but institutions in size. and. Uh, institutions within institutions might be a way to put it. Uh, and then the system campus experience and, and understanding, at least from the materials I was able to review, um, an and understanding of how that systemness and working together is valuable for the whole institution. And then candidate D, really um, some unique perspectives, again, within large research institutions and um, notable accomplishments achieved in a variety of their leadership positions, um, as well as some unique ties to Minnesota as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Regent Kenyanya, you're next. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> We're going around. <laughs> well, Cody, I could ask I, Brian, I, I could yeah, ask yeah, President Ettinger, but you're next. <laughs> I, I love his thoughts. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I call the question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, thank you all. Um, you know, having a hard decision is, is a really great place to be at. So thanks to the committee, its leadership, and everyone who volunteered their time. Um, starting with candidate A, I mean, as it's been said, they've demonstrated 
leadership um, in higher education at different levels um, and are they are proven team builder, consensus builder. And I actually think their specific academic area um, is, is relevant as well. And uh, a long history of community partnerships, unique community partnerships, as my colleagues over there uh, enumerated, really you know, breaking down the campus walls and, and making sure the university is part of the community that it is. And that's really impressive. And of course, uh, the affinity and connection to the state of Minnesota. Candidate B is, you know, visionary, has a unique background and unique background in different positions in a, what I would I mean, what I would describe as a, a large, uh, not, not just large, I mean, large research university, but a, a peer, you know, a respectable peer, you know, one that we speak about here when we're talking about peers and comparing ourselves. So um, that's relevant, a system as well. Um, I, also think, I also think their specific academic background, their specific area of of expertise and practice is is uh, very relevant for us uh, at this university at this moment specifically. Candidate C has an impressive personal academic background, um, and I, th I think as everyone has said, just a just a, um, a wide range of experience in higher education in different institutions as well. I I think a colleague described them as a steadying hand and that's how they come across uh to me for sure and the the call out of their experience working with tribal nations is certainly relevant with the conversations that we're having at our university in our history Kennedy is um uh, energetic is, is how they were described um, forward thinking, looking at their cover letter, so much of it was speaking about the future, the future. And of course, you know, we're going to understand someone's background from the CV and from, if you have Google, I mean, you can go and see what they did. And while some of that was called out in the cover letter, there was so much about what the university could do and explore in this way. And, and I would describe it almost as a mini strategic plan um, in a way. And, and that's, um, I think that's a pro, it, just in terms of where their thinking is and their affinity to Minnesota also stood out to me, Madam Chair. Thank you. Regent Turner. It's very hard to speak that way. I don't have to take four minutes, do I? No, you do not. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna listen to everyone, agree with everyone, but I'm gonna focus on what was important, has been we want to hear from steadily you. important to me all along. So uh, candidate A, um, the fact that they have, um, have actively uh, worked with the government relations, um, strong media um, experience, and then also um, working partnerships with the community, uh, and and that would and I would say that would be a benefit for all of our campuses to have somebody with that strong experience. It's a given that they all have the research, education, academic, and all that. Um, B, uh, we keep using the word unique experience. I like, and they do have unique experience. I would I, I respect the fact that they. It appears they kind of went up through the ranks, and so they understand from the ground up, which is a, I appreciate that perspective. Um, C, uh, this, uh, somebody who inspires confidence and trust, um, no. but it's, it, it's no secret that a lot of times higher ed recently gets a bad, a bad rap. And so to have somebody that inspire and able to work with um, all, all groups of people and inspire the trust and confidence, that's somebody worth noting. And then lastly, D, um, 
going back to higher ed, higher ed is a lot of challenges. And so to have a leader that's got bold vision and a, and a, and a vision for higher ed for the future, that's important to me. Thank you. Regent Wheeler. Yeah, thank you. And boy, again, these are incredible candidates. And I mean, thank you all for doing a service. And thank you to the committee, which I heard too was one of the best. And I, I think it was unheard of that there's 100% endorsement of these candidates through a selection committee. So kudos to all of you. And boy, have you presented us some um, really wonderful people. And, you know, three of the four at least have ties to the university, you know, as, as well as has been mentioned. But but let me start with candidate A. So uh, really uh, like the demonstrated leadership of this candidate, the breadth of experience, uh, relationship orientation, and a demonstrated commitment to the community, but able to make uh, decisions as well. Um, very positive references from the, every stakeholder um, that I saw um, or heard from. Um, really good on public presentation, uh, fairly unflappable as a leader and uh, really, um, can advance, I think, the tripartite mission in, a, in an excellent way. Candidate B uh, hails from an excellent uh, top-level university, uh, pertinent skill sets with issues facing the University of Minnesota, uh, research grounding, but teaching and administration background, and uh, has some um, background in crisis um, management and has gone through that and uh, done exceptionally well with that. Um, candidate C. Um, again, high level and breadth of experience, um, academic respect and accomplishments are there, but with the associated humility to be successful. Um, I love the tribal nation uh, work as has been mentioned. Communication skills really strong. Um, uh, Chair Mayron said, hey, look at some of the videos online for some of these people. And so that, that's been telling too, and again, demonstrates the strength of all of them. Um, relationship uh, and team building and cultural understanding here. Uh, and, that, and candidate D, I'd say, you know, demonstrated track record of performance. Uh, we've, everybody said high energy, very engaging, a generative thinker who is future oriented. So uh, again, really great candidates uh, making uh, choices difficult, which is a wonderful choice to have. So thank you. Thank you. Uh for me, uh, candidate A, uh, what I'm drawing to is this is a person who, well, let, before I actually get into the specifics, let me say that each one of the candidates. You want the, you want the. Uh, each, oh, I'm yeah. so sorry. Uh, I forgot. All right. We're not going to talk about me right now. Uh, let's go to Regent <laughs> Hipsch, and then we'll go to Regent Tel yeah, There you go. He's the forgettable co-vice chair. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, All right, Doug, I'm My volume is on, Mike. <laughs> time and I'm calling you out of order. Yes, Madam yeah. Chair. Junior Vice Chair, yeah. Okay. Um, so I want to echo what the whole committee has said about uh, the four unbelievable candidates that they brought forward. I think it's, uh, having served on the last presidential committee, uh, search committee, I know how difficult it can be and and uh, how rewarding it also is because we're really determining the leadership of the, of the university for the next whatever number of years. So, and I also I want to echo what uh, Regent Gully said about uh, having not been in the room and seeing uh, the people who they are and and how they act. It's really hard to to try to judge you know to judge people based on a piece of paper. But I'm going to try anyway. So here I go. So. Um, candidate A has really, really great Minnesota ties, uh, well-respected, uh, good leadership, and, uh, and understands leadership, which is different. Uh, she understands the uniqueness of each campus, the systemness. She leads the complex system involved in the community needs. Okay, candidate B, um, great experience, relevancy and background that is useful. Uh, Big Ten, which is great, strategic planner, uh, great research, great leadership skills, and seems very collaborative. Uh, candidate C, uh, they seem very intelligent, trust builder, good leadership, well-respected with peers. It's been said to, that they're humble, uh, collaborative, uh, strong research and scholarship. Candidate B, 
Uh, again, a U of M background, very forward thinking, deep connection, very energetic. It feels like they are a leading edge thinker. That's my notes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regent Kipsch. Regent Telrabi, glad you're able to participate. <laughs> Go ahead and share with us what you, uh, what draws you to each of the candidates. Sure. Thank you, Chair Mayron. And I apologize. I'll keep my video uh, off because it's quite late here. <laughs> um, and you don't want to see me right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just echo my thanks to the committee for uh, doing such of the heavy lift at, to getting us these four excellent candidates. And uh, they're all very impressive. So reading all the materials, I think that um, um, I'm just so uh, glad that uh, we didn't have to, but uh, the full slate, but are, are getting um, uh, to review these four. Um, for me, candidate A, um, some things that stood out to me were really about kind of the, the unique connection to the university and understanding of the systemness that uh, um, exists here at the university a commitment to teams and partnerships, um, also commitment to DEI and uh, the various stakeholders that um, a university has. Um, for candidate B, um, some things that stood out to me were about kind of the impressive uh, development experience. Um, being really innovative and in growing the institution um, and also having expertise in areas that uh, we need right now, uh, including crisis management um, and being a part of a large institution that is our peer. Uh, candidate C, things that stood out to me were about um, just, again, an impressive overall uh, it, uh, executive experience, um, the commitment to shared governance um, within the institution, uh, strong legislative relations um, and advocacy experience, um, and uh, engagement with uh, a variety of stakeholders and understanding of strategic uh, processes and planning. And of course, uh, folks have already mentioned it, but really being uh, committed to um, working with the diverse communities that uh, exist within uh, the, the institutions, um, stakeholders. Uh, candidate D, um, some things that stood out to me about this candidate were about their decisiveness and being forward thinking um, and um, a commitment to relationship building. Um, so that's all for me. Thank you, Regent Tarabi. Mm -hmm. uh, now getting to me and to myself. Uh, let me just say before I address each of the four candidates, one thing I was impressed about each and every one of them is their strong commitment to DEI. Every one of them uh, called that out and gave uh, examples of uh, how they commitment has played itself out. So that was very important to me. And I'm not gonna list it as a separate strength because each and every one of them had it, which was so important. As to candidate A, uh, what draws me to this candidate is this is an individual who is uh, has a senior administrative position who has uh, a very great breadth of experience and has dealt with many of the same issues that we are confronting or that we anticipate confronting in the future, including financial challenges, shifting sands in the college athletics arena, balancing free speech uh, versus our, the codes of conduct, understanding the declining trust in the value of a college education that is confronting all of our uh, is confronting higher education. This individual has a leadership style that uh, is very collaborative and values diversity of view. This individual has an appreciation of systemness, but at the same time, um, 
understands the uniqueness of each campus. This person is experienced in developing a strategic plan and seems to embrace that opportunity. And this person has a, a good experience in the legislative arena. As to candidate B, uh, this individual has successfully, uh, what stood out for me, successfully advocated with the legislature on a variety of different priorities in ways that I thought uh, were creative uh, and that I wanted the opportunity to explore with this individual. Uh, this individual uh, also called out the, the work that this individual has done with indigenous tribes, very important. This uh, person has experience in working in a very decentralized uh, environment and with a decentralized budget, which is uh, what we have as well. Person uh, has uh, excellent experience of working with alumni, donors, and appears to greatly enjoy it, which is so important to success. Uh, and also has experience uh, in doing multidisciplinary fundraising. This person uh, brings uh, expertise in areas that we are of particular concern to us, substantive concern to us right now, uh, and has, I think, uh, evidence of very strong appreciation of Minnesota. Candidate C um, uh, has strong experience and commitment to strategic planning and the importance of gathering input from many stakeholders and the importance of tying it to the state's economic development plan, which I think is so important. We don't develop these strategic plans in a vacuum. At the end of the day, they must serve our students, our faculty, staff, but the state as well. This individual has been successful in advocating uh, before their legislature and in obtaining funding for certain needs and projects appropriate to that institution. This person in debate, uh, ind has, uh, indicates a very strong financial management skills, including how to deal with a budget reduction. Uh, this person understands the need to develop many revenue streams, the importance of that, that you just can't rely on tuition and um, a contribution from the state, and um, has a, a strong record of success in fundraising. Candidate D uh, has um, broad experience in a number of areas of importance to us, is very innovative and a bold visionary and very forward thinking, understands the importance of lifelong learning, which I think is so important as our population is aging, or age as for some of us. <laughs> <laughs> understands uh, that healthcare must extend beyond the treatment, beyond treatment to prevention, which I think we've all talked about is very important to us. Has a strong commitment to what the extension division can offer and the impact that uh, it can play on the community at large within Minnesota. And again, very strong success and commitment to fundraising. Those were the items that uh, drew me to that candidate. All right, at this point, we will now shift to the second part of this phase, and that is for each of us to share what may uh, cause us concern about a, each of the four candidates, or we'd like more information, or think there needs to be, um, they need more development on uh, as well. And again, we will start with the, those members of the selection committee, our regents who were there. Uh, and we'll go in the reverse order that I went before. So we'll start first with uh, Regent uh, Ruth Johnson, and then we will move to Regent Farnsworth and then to the chair of the committee, Regent Davenport. Okay, thank you, Chair Mayron. Well, I'm pleased to say that for this part, I have less to say than I did for uh, the first time because uh, I really think these are some excellent candidates, but uh, primarily focus sort of on one thing maybe for each one. So with candidate A, I would I just think it would be interesting for us to say, you know, to describe capacity for visioning huge, complex initiatives that are part of an institution like this, uh, maybe something like what we're working with the, currently with the Academic Health Center, just ask that person to describe and how they would how they would approach that, their role and their understanding of president's uh, action in, in such an initiative. Um, with uh, candidate B, 
I would have somewhat similar things. How, would, how have you managed a new initiative, shepherding something from concept to well-formed project? How do you get buy-in? How do you implement? How about, how about follow-up? I'd just like to, to explore that. Uh, with candidate C, again, similar things. Discuss your approach to creating a new initiative, starting building a team, selling the concept, strategic planning, uh, and building uh, support. And uh, with candidate D, uh, similar thing. Describe how you've developed a new initiative with emphasis on strategic vision. And then maybe describe if any example of something you experienced where you think that maybe mistakes were made along the way. What have you learned? How do how we go forward from there? Thank so. you very much. Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. I um, do not have anything to add on candidate A. Um, candidate B, I would uh, think about additional reflection on student affairs related topics and working with ranges of stakeholders in the spirit of Regent Ruth Johnson's comments uh, she just made on candidate B. Um, candidate C, um, would want to think more about or maybe probe into how they would take us to the next level, how they would think about affecting change, how would they react to um, the bold visioning that's often required in strategic planning processes. Uh, and then candidate D, um, thinking about their ability to uh, couple um, nature, you know, a nature of leaning towards um, pursuing very bold visions and being receptive to where the university is at and incorporating feedback from stakeholders in that process. Thank you. All right, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, my areas to explore are same or similar for all candidates, uh, including uh, what's the vision or plan for um, maybe philosophy about building strong relationships with the Board of Regents, uh, record of building an effective leadership team, uh, what would be a plan for the first 90 days, what but our budgeting experiences and outcomes as related to financial sustainability while ensuring investment and quality, uh, difficult budget decisions they may have been involved, uh, what decision was reached and what outcomes, um, how leadership skills translate into enterprise or system leadership, uh, and bringing that to scale as uh, we need within our university system. I'd like to learn more about how each would demonstrate commitment to diverse populations within Minnesota and um, serving our mission. Uh, I'd like to learn more about their commitment to and style of shared governance. And finally, what does each candidate look for in terms of support they need to be successful? Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, then we will uh, go to our other regents and we're gonna start with uh, Regent Talrabi. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, I think sim similar to uh, Regent um, uh, Davenport, I will just say some questions that I would have for all four of them are um, just trying to understand kind of a little bit deeper about how they would go about um, building um, relationships across the um, the state. You know, building a statewide um, uh, institution. Um, uh, hearing a bit more about, even though there's a lot of governance um, experience, that shared governance. Um, commitment and what that looks like, understanding the, uh, what they envision, um, given what they know about the university, um, being able to hear about that, and then how they would go about kind of building strong teams. Um, I think each of them had different strengths, and I'd be curious to hear more about how, how they would assess that and how they would build that, because it seems like each might approach that differently. So. All right, thank you. That's, that's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Regent Hipsch. Uh, thank you, Chair Mayron. For me, I thought, you know, I my, my questions, I guess, will come out in the interviews more, but it's more about the changing dynamics of being a college president. Well, today's college presidents are working with legislators more. They're doing more fundraising and donors. The land grant mission in a in a very diverse state like Minnesota, um, diverse populations. You have all kinds of stuff, and the public sentiment for higher education is at a 
a decade low or something like that. And so how do we bring that all around and how do we bring that back? And I couldn't get that out of the resumes because uh, that, you know, it just didn't come out uh, from their resumes. So those are the questions I would ask. Just basically the changing dynamics of being a college president in this day and age. Thank you. Regent Wheeler. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate, you know, led by Regent Davenport, and we're starting to develop a core set of questions for the entire group, you know, which is really important. So I think that that core is, is great. I'll, I'll focus mine on specific questions I might ask of their backgrounds. Uh, not, I don't have any on candidate A. On candidate B, I'd want to know uh, the approach to developing a comprehensive strategic planning and uh, involvement in that in that plan. Uh, don't really have anything strongly for candidate C. On candidate D, I would want to have uh, uh, ask about a major initiative that they've led and uh, what the how they involve stakeholders in that process. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Turner. Um, I like many of the other ones have like some general questions, like um, and kind of focusing on what we have here and now. Uh, one question that I think is is what experience have they had with difficult budget decisions? Because we could very much be in that boat. And then the other one is um, with, with new ideas and moving forward, new ideas are, are wonderful and I'm all for bold vision, um, but what experience have they had uh, dealing with the old versus the new and, and being able to create relationships and, and and changing a very, what I'm finding out to be a very traditional type of setting is higher ed and steeped in tradition. And what experience have they had in potentially changing the system? Thank you. Regent Ruth Johnson. Oh, we definitely. I've already <laughs> had gotten yours. All right, Regent Kenyanya. Yeah, um, just a few brief comments. I won't be too repetitive. And I think, I mean, some of these are questions, some of these are observations, not necessarily deal breakers per se. Um, I do think, probably with the exception of candidate B, their current institutions um, are, are a jump. I mean, that, that's not, again, not a deal breaker, but just a jump in terms of size or scope or their position within them and can still be successful, but I just want to note that. Um, I think uh, with candidate A, I was their their written materials. There again, you know, we didn't have the benefit of meeting them, but their C, not the CV, the cover letter um, w was was really good, um, but it it read like our priorities, and I, obviously they did their homework. Um, but you know, I'm like, what is what is your vision? Um, cause it, it was kind of like reading our vision, uh, back to us. And I don't know if ours is any good. We came up with it, Madam Chair. So oh. I, 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 I want to see someone else's. Um, but, and then, and then candidate B, their experiences, everyone talked about their unique and highly relevant experience, but it is, they, they do have deep experience at different levels, but in what I'd say one area, using that term loosely. And there's, um, so I'd, I'd maybe in questioning want to just find out more about their experience in the other lanes, if you will, of university leadership, and particularly um, uh, st student life, student engagement, and things like that. Yeah. Any comments as to candidates C and D specific to them? And you don't have to, you, don't, you know, I just want to make uh, sure. I, I, not yeah. at this moment, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Regent. Very <laughs> like you weren't sure if you wanted to call on me. No, I, it's like, <laughs> I, I know, it's been a day. I need, I need all these names like switch ship. Okay. Um, so the, the areas I'd like to uh, in probe further, there's the word I'm looking for, um, approaches to goal setting, particularly as we look to our new strategic plan. Is this, are these general These are comments? general. General, okay, thank you. Um, really, like Regent Wheeler said, these are amazing candidates. And so it, 
finding specific issues really ended up applying to all of them. Um, approaches to goal setting as we look at our next strategic planning and then questioning on their perspective of innovating versus leveraging existing systems um, and how those two concepts work together. Uh, digging a little bit deeper into balancing speed of decision making versus thoughtfulness and information gathering in that process. Uh, also, how each um, see themselves developing relationships under our shared governance model. Um, learning about how they consider implications of long-term, how they consider long-term implications of their present day decision making. Um, you know, how far out are they looking or how are they calculating that and how they're making their decisions. And then really how each of them go about fostering diversity of opinions, diversity of thought, perspective, individuals in each of those, um, in, in the way that they do their job and, and would envision doing their job here at the university. Thank you. Regent Tad Johnson. <laughs> uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, just overall concerns for all four of them. Um, so they, be, you know, would become the face and voice of the University of Minnesota. And um, it's important how they come across and uh, with the legislature um, uh, and uh, when doing uh, interviews on the University of Minnesota. I also like to make sure that there is a strong commitment to the outstate campuses. Um, and um, um, I know several of them have experiences with um, satellite campuses, and that's good. Um, but um, I don't know, there's a lot, of, a lot of uniqueness in our system. Um, and Minnesota is a unique place. So getting to know uh, the state or having some knowledge of the state, which some of them, which all of them have some connection with Minnesota is important. Um, fundraising and um, um, ensuring that, you know, um, with tying into government relations, um, uh, knowledge of the budget and and um, some wisdom about um, going forward with a strategic plan. Thank you. Regent Gulley. Thank you, Chair. Um, as I've been sitting here listening to what everyone else said um, and thinking about the things that I uh, thought about, um, so first of all, all four of these candidates are extraordinarily strong. And I think um, just on paper, any one of them could be great leaders for our institution. One of the things that I think is most important about this role is the ability to take and hold space for and in fact invite critique and dissent. Um, that feels incredibly important to me as a leadership skill um, when I think about how we have relationships with our system campuses, with our legislators, with people in, here in the Twin Cities, um, with our students, with our faculty. This is a role that requires a high level of ability to hold space for dissent and critique mm -hmm. and to not take it personally and to see it as an opportunity to hear what people are saying and see it as an opportunity for growth and to take all that in and process it and figure out how to use that to grow our institution and to make us better. So if there was one thing that I would really want to know, it would be how, how do you create space for dissent? How do you invite it? How do you ask people for critiques and, and take it and use it in, you know, to grow? Um, and that's for all four candidates. And, and the specific things that I had on this list, so I'll go ahead and mention them, but they all go back to that. Um, their view on higher ed as, and on public institutions and our role on um, dealing with complex issues, um, both current and historic. Um, you know, thinking about the ways that we, that some of the decisions that have been made before us haven't aged well and how do we go back and try to rectify those things, but also understanding that some of the decisions that we're going to make today aren't going to feel good in 20 years. And, and knowing that that's a, 
okay and that we're making the best decisions that we can right now, but being able to hold space for people to go back and change those things later without feeling like it's a, in, you know, like people are interrogating the things that they did and, you know, um, uh, how they see our faculty, staff, students, unions as partners in this work, um, legislators, um, people on all the campuses, not just the Twin Cities, um, how they see our role in closing gaps and challenging dynamics and, and in our state. And um, yeah, and how they, how they see our priorities, how they are gonna prioritize spending decisions and how they're gonna prioritize um, how we make decisions about tuition and how we make decisions about salaries and things like that. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's, that's what I've got. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, for me, let me um, say generally, um, as we ultimately have the opportunity to, to talk to uh, the candidates, um, I will be focusing um, on the, the premise that the past is the best predictor of the future. And so to, it's, it, I will be interested in their philosophy and general, what they, how they would articulate their general approach. But for me, on any variety of topics, but I will want to know how that played out in the past. How did they walk the talk in the past so that I can have some comfort that they have experience um, grounded experience in the issues that we're raising and, and be able to look at how they approach them. And if they don't, which some of our candidates may not, then how will they get, get what, give me examples of how you have addressed when you're lacking information or you don't have experience, how you, what you do to garner um, all the information you need to make a decision on a going forward basis, because each one of these candidates is fabulous as they all, they, they come with different experiences and each one of them will not have experience in one or more of the issues that we're going to have to address. So how they've done that in the past when they don't have that previous experience. Um, that said, uh, as to the specific candidates, I don't have any comments uh, about developmental or concerns with candidate A. With respect to candidate B, um, because this individual has a more, uh, I would say, limited portfolio of experience, uh, uh, Regent Kenyanya picked up on that, <coughs> I will want to ask that individual and assure myself that they can build on that and what they will do to address those areas that they have not had previous experience in, um, in terms of their development as an administrator. With re, uh, candidate C, I don't have any uh, specific concerns or development issues. And with respect to candidate D, it's, um, uh, what drew, uh, drew me to this candidate is this innovative approach, this bold visionary uh, approach. But at the same time, I, I am concerned or will want to explore how this candidate then builds consensus uh, from a variety of stakeholders to support that vision, that bold new vision or that innovative approach. Um, and again, drawing on what experience have they, can they point to in the past where they have done that to garner support for some innovative ideas. So uh, that concludes this part of the exercise. Before we go to the DOT exercise though, what I wanna do is now open it up to each of you. If you have any questions of your colleagues, about something they said that you would like clarification about or more information, this is the time to raise it with your respective colleague. It's not the time to argue with them or convince them otherwise. It's to make sure you've got a, a, a sufficient sense of where your colleagues were coming from. So anybody have any questions of clarification? <laughs> I'm watching uh, Regent Kenyanya. Um, all right, anybody, and I don't see any hands raised on the uh, Zoom conference here. 
All right. Well, then uh, what we will do is uh, we're going to take a very uh, short break and we're, then we're going to and I would say basically a five minute break and then we're going to move to phase two, which is the dot exercise. And again, you've each been given an allocation of two dot stickers. We'd ask I'd ask that you apply your dots to the two individuals that you most believe should be selected for interview by us for the position. Remind you, you must use both dots. And you can only use one dot per person. You can't load up your two dots on a person or withhold a dot uh, so as to emphasize a particular person. And again, this is by no means the point of this exercise is not to identify two candidates we want to interview. It's rather we're looking for trends to see where are we seeing um, greater interest or support and where are we seeing um, that there is not at the same level of support or interest with a particular candidate or candidates. So let's take a short five minute break. Uh, if you don't need it, go ahead and put your dots on, uh, but then we'll come back and take it from there. Oh.
at the stuff you need from the others. Uh, everyone, if you could be seated, please. I call the meeting back to order. At this time, we will go ahead and apply our dots to the charts behind us and start to get a visual on if there, we're leaning in any particular direction. Uh, Executive Director uh, Steves ha will have the information as to how Regents uh, Hipsch and Talrabi want their dots placed, so he will be placing them on their behalf. All right, why don't we do that? And then if you, Regents, if you would return to your seats and then we will, we can all eyeball what's going on there, but then we'll open up for general discussion uh, to talk about the candidates as a group. All right, let's go do our dots. Has everybody placed their dots and you've placed the dots on behalf of the uh, region sensors? I have. All right. Um, well, we can all visually see, uh, I, we're seeing here um, some strong consensus around candidates A, B, and C. You all can see it as well. Um, and less interest in candidate D. And with that, uh, I think we can open it up for discussion as to uh, how we proceed uh, with uh, what we're seeing here on the board and what, uh, how people are feeling in light of the discussion and the strengths that we talked about, what drew us to each of the candidates, which caused concerns. Now we can get more specific as to each of the candidates, recognizing the importance of us staying in a, having our discussion in a very de-identified manner. So uh, we can open it up for discussion and what I would suggest is like we do generally, if you want to uh, raise your hand or uh, indicate that you would like to speak right now, we can do that. Um, I will just start off uh, and make one comment. I know several of my colleagues talked about um, as things that drew them to a particular candidate was their um, connection or affinity with Minnesota, the state of Minnesota. I, I will just say personally for me, um, that is a uh, relatively low, if not importance at all. I'm more concerned about does this person have the skill set and the characteristics to be able to deal with what we deal with in Minnesota, but the fact that they may have had uh, some experience here at Minnesota, within the state of Minnesota, or even with the University of Minnesota, it is, sits very low with me and would not be uh, um, something that would drive my particular decision. So that's just my own feeling as we talk through candidates. So who would like to weigh in first? All right, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Someone has to go first. So yes, thought, someone. Why not? You gotta kick us off. Um, I'll just, uh, one thought, the last couple rounds of discussion were really, really good and really helpful, so I appreciated that. I mean, you can hear the meeting when you're in the back, so I did hear the whole discussion, just to be clear. Uh, and um, I would just say in, well, two things about the dot exercise, I would say the, um, you know, this is one piece of the information that we're discussing right now, but I would say um, what the, the groups of dots right now um, reflect um, my interests are li aligned with where I'm at at this point. And then also um, maybe in, in response or to add on uh, what uh, Regent Mayron was just talking about in relation to connection with Minnesota, uh, I don't think uh, that uh, characteristic exclusively is towards the top of my list, but I, I tend to appreciate that and find that um, a delight when it comes to thinking 
about um, the relationship building pieces, the um, stakeholder relations that this um, person will need to do. And so in totality, I would say it's perhaps higher up in my list than maybe it is for Chair Mayron. But again, we all look at these things differently. So thank you. Okay. Other comments, questions, concerns? Yes. Madam Chair, my By the way, we don't have, you know, I don't mean to suggest we have to talk about this and have a fulsome discussion if there is an interest in a fulsome discussion uh, for whatever, you know, based on what we're seeing here in the first round of the DOT exercise. I don't want to make work for us if, if we, uh, that's not the direction we want to go. So with that, Regent Kenyon. Yeah, thank you. I th yeah, I certainly have thoughts. I think we're all just collecting them, and I'll try to do that on the fly here. Um, while I'm tempted to reenact 12 angry men with regards to candidate D, I'll, um, I'll let that one pass. I, I, I want to speak to candidate B, particularly. Okay. All right. um, I feel very strongly about candidate B. Um, you know, I, something I forgot to call out, and I think it may have been called out, is their experience with crisis management, um, high stress environments, and particularly the um, the challenges that they faced at their institution uh, recently. They called them out, and um, I think we're somewhat aware of those. And I, th I think uh, that's really important for this position. Additionally, they actually talked. I mean, it, it, it's in their resume as well, but uh, experience thinking about and planning and making decisions related to campus safety. Uh, I think that's very relevant. Um, it's in their experience, but also just natural to some of their background. And additionally, with, with my earlier comment about their particular area of expertise and background, and, and you know, I kind of talked about how there's these different lanes of university leadership and university governance. The, the expertise they bring is, I don't know how to phrase this, it's, um, it's one that like either you have or you don't, whereas some others could, can be augmented with, with the right team and the right expertise around you. Um, and this is just unique that either a senior leader is going to have this kind of background or, or not. But um, overall, I feel pretty strongly about this candidate. Okay. Other individuals who would like to speak? And making sure I tap into Regents uh, Hipsch and Tarabi as well. I will say from, uh, oh, go ahead. I would rather hear from others first. Re Regent Gully. Oh, thank you, Tara. I, um, <laughs> ideally for me, we would get a chance to see all three of these candidates. Uh, I, not that we shouldn't, you know, I know we're not taking D out of here, but the fact that we have three that get strong support for me, I would like to introduce all three of these candidates to our campus campuses i know that might be ill-advised so i'm you know i think we should continue this conversation um because i'm afraid that we'll lose i just want to be really clear i if i thought we could get all three of these candidates to come to campus and to come to our system and do the tour i would like to present them all what i worry about is that we'll lose mm -hmm. one or two of them if there are three candidates um that's my biggest fear uh because I don't want to lose them ahead of the opportunity for folks to get to know them. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, I also really like candidate B. And one of the things I want to point out is their deep experience with healthcare, And especially as we're in the middle of this big growth and transition with our medical schools uh, and <laughs> our um, healthcare institutions, um, having that deep knowledge I think could be really helpful and um, I'll echo everything that Regent Kenyanya said as well. So I think that that's really important experience, but I feel like lifting that up is also really important. But for me, if we could, and we thought we could get all three of them to come and do and meet our campuses, that would be my choice. 
Thank you. Let me let me just say, and I know Regent Farnsworth, I think you've got, you were indicating a desire to talk. Uh, to address that issue, um, we have uh, the board office, as we've been working with the four candidates, have worked extensively with them about the fact that there are four, and what if all four advanced or uh, something uh, less than four. Um, and I think I can say with confidence, and uh, Executive Director Steves can confirm, that if there are three candidates, regardless of what the mix in, they will all come. Mm -hmm. So if your worry is that you're going to lose people because if there's three as opposed to two, mm -hmm. um, then I think you can be assured that those individuals, regardless of the mix here, mm -hmm. they're going to stay with the process. And, you know, all of the candidates understood the process from the get go that if once we select who to be interviewed, it goes public. And they've all addressed that issue, not only with a board office, but with our consultants as well. Could I just quickly follow up and just thank and I'm, I'm sure the candidates are going to watch this. And I just want to thank them for doing that, because I know that it's it's a big ask, um, but I feel like having the opportunity for them to interact with our students and with our faculty and with our staff and with our community members and stakeholders is just such an incredibly important part of this process. So I'm deeply grateful to them for um, accepting that. Thank you. Um, I, I will also just share uh, um, my perspective is that what the three candidates that are emerging here on the uh, dot exercise, candidate A with nine dots and B and C with seven dots. I personally would be very excited to interview and would like to interview all three of them yeah. yep. mm -hmm. as well. And yep. so uh, that's my, I'm very excited about that prospect. Each one of them just sounds uh, outstanding. And, and the next step is to be able to meet and greet and and ask the hard questions that we've all been talking about. And um, I would like to do that with all three as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing hot heads going up and down, but the next one was to speak was Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Um, I got in queue earlier, and of course the discussion has moved, mm -hmm. and so I'm intrigued on what you just said, and I heard agreement on, and so maybe I'll move in that direction in a moment. Um, but um, I, what, so I got in line when Regent Kenyanya was talking about candidate B, um, which then led me, or sparked some thought around something that I was, you know, naturally perhaps listening for within the process was, um, experience with working with boards and the board governance relationship um, between the president role and the board. And I think that is something that I view um, strong in, in actually candidates A and B. So I haven't heard a lot of talk specifically about the board relations and so wanted to bring that up. Um, I'm tempted to potentially make a motion um, and maybe seen some support for that. So, you know what, I'll do it and we'll see what happens. If that's well, okay. Let me, let or, me, before yeah. you do that. Yeah, I can me, wait. Yeah, let me yeah, just yeah. ask, you know, I, I want to get a sense from the group here. Are we ready to entertain a motion by Regent Farnsworth or before we have a motion, would people like to engage in more discussion? Yeah. It, let's go. Ready. Regent Kenyanya. Ready. Uh, Regent Kenyanya? Yeah. Uh, are you going to address that issue? I think so. Okay, good. <laughs> you be the judge. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Your Honor. Um, I, I, I would just, I mean, I, it, it, it sounds like there's consensus around that. I would just only offer the comment that we be sure that, at least for ourselves individually, we are... Um, seriously considering each of them just to say let's not advance three because it's easier to and i'm not saying that's what we're doing or you know because we could finish and be done for the day but as regent gully pointed out that is a huge ask of the candidates and we want to give the university community more options absolutely to see all of them but if you do have a reservation it, i think it's more prudent to speak about it than to than to ask that of a candidate um you know, to go tour the state and, and, and we could have narrowed it down here. So I'm not saying we narrow it. I'm saying we advance three because we believe in all three strongly, not because we can live with it. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I, I, that's the assumption I'm making because when we did the dot exercise, we did them individually right. uh, as mm -hmm. opposed to, um, I mean, so we were each saying our preferences mm -hmm. and, um, and so I assume, I know all of my colleagues did their homework, studied all the materials, gathered whatever information they could on all four candidates in order to come here today to be able to make these hard decisions. Uh, anybody want to have more discussion or uh, are we ready to entertain a motion by Regent Farnsworth? Yeah, ready. Uh, can, can a different region offer it? <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. I know. I, uh, I was going okay. oh, to be polite. All right. Comments. Like, give me my gavel. <laughs> <laughs> He's been totally out of order. <laughs> all right. Regent Farnsworth, do you want to make a motion? Yes. Thank you, Chair Mayron. And I'm open to any um, language tweaks that this needs per OBR. But I would move that we advance candidate A, B, and C to the next um, phase of the process for um, public engagement and interviews by the board. Is there a second? Second. Is that what language works efficiently? That'll work. All right. <laughs> Any discussion? <laughs> then uh, we'll do a roll call. On the motion to name candidates A, B, and C as finalists for the University of Minnesota presidency, Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Farnsworth? Yes. Regent Farnsworth votes yes. Regent Gully? Yes. Regent Gully votes yes. Regent Hipsch? Yes. Regent Hipsch votes yes. Regent Ruth Johnson? Yes. Regent Ruth Johnson votes yes. Regent Tad Johnson? Yes. Regent Tad Johnson votes yes. Regent Kenyanya? Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Tayurabe? Yes. Regent Tayurabe votes yes. Regent Turner? Yes. Regent Turner votes yes. Regent Verhalen? Yes. Regent Verhalen votes yes. Regent Wheeler? Yes. Regent Wheeler votes yes. Chair Mayron? Yes. Chair Mayron votes yes. Uh, the vote is uh, 12 in favor, zero opposed. The motion carries. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to say a couple things uh, at this point. First of all, congratulations uh, to everyone who participated. I know we are all very, very, very excited to reach this point and to go to the next step, which is to invite these individuals to meet with us and to meet with the various stakeholders around the state. That said, to my colleagues, I have to remind you that this is still confidential. I will shortly after this meeting concludes be calling each of the three candidates. And then uh, at that point, I, at some point here, OBR will advise when their names are being made public and then you can share them as well. But until that happens, you need to maintain the confidentiality of these names until we've been able to accomplish that. Any questions about it? And will you notify us then when it's the names are public and people can start talking about it? Yeah. Madam Chair, we will do that. Okay. Yes. All right. Anything that you all want to add uh, from the board office? Madam Chair, members of the board, I would just say that this now will kick off. Well, first of all, this is the first time, at least in modern history, that the university will have more than one candidate in the public phase for president of the University of Minnesota. So that's a really big deal. Um, the second thing I would just say is we've been working closely with each of these candidates. And the next phase of this is for the university community to interview these individuals. And um, that will be on each of the five campuses in person. Um, the first candidate uh, will be on one of our campuses starting Monday morning. Mm -hmm. So just to give you a sense of how quickly we're going to move on this. Um, so next week we'll have two candidates here. The week after will be the third candidate. And then, um, and then we'll uh, quickly move to your interviews. So, do you have a date then for the interviews in light of? Not, not yet. yet. Okay. Not yet. All right. We'll have we have dates on your calendar held, and we'll let you know as soon as we can release those. All right. Um, also, I see that our um, consultants have now uh, moved from their icon to the, we're seeing their faces. Is there anything? Uh, I just want to make sure from those from what Kiefer that you wanted to say or make a statement about. Uh, no, I think um, everything is good on our end and congratulations. And I think uh, you'll be excited to hear from these candidates live. So no nothing else to add. I concur. All right. 
Uh, yes, Regent Wheeler. Just a brief, thank you, Chair Mayor, and just a brief thing. Uh, obviously, candidate D was also a very strong individual and uh, well respected. Just wanted to see how the communication went that goes there. Can I just echo? <clears throat> yes. Echo that and also say I had, I spent a little bit of time looking through the um, documents for the other people who applied as well, and we had so many very strong candidates, and I'm so grateful to all of them for taking the time and putting in the effort to apply, and um, and the committee did an excellent job at going through all of those, but for everyone who applied, even if you didn't make the finalist list, thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. All right. Any other further comments before we adjourn the meeting? Yes, Regent Farns. Yeah, really quick, Madam Chair, and maybe this is to Mr. Steves, but um, just to be really clear for the public, when these become public, does this play out on, does a, does a release play out on the presidential search website? Obviously, there's a media component to this, but where should um, anyone who's interested at some point today look for that information? Um, uh, Madam Chair, yes. uh, Regent Farnsworth, it, uh, the, the primary source of information will be the presidential search website, but we will be issuing a press release, we'll be using social media, we'll be using um, a system-wide message, we'll be using lots of things later this afternoon. We have all poised, ready to go um, as soon as some of these phone calls get made. Great, thank you. Any further comments, discussion? Then with that, there being no additional business before the board, this meeting is adjourned. Thank <laughs> you.